One. I used to work for an extended stay hotel. In literally every department, we were a small hotel with a bit over 100 rooms. Boss offered overtime and I wanted overtime. We got a lot of people staying for work. Most would leave their families at home. If they brought their families, it meant their job was willing to pay lots of money for whatever service they provide their employers. So we would suck up to the guest, keep them happy, keep them at the hotel. I was indifferent, or liked almost all the guests. Even the difficult ones, but this one lady still makes me grumpy years later. She was the nanny of a husband and wife doctor team, I think, and she was awful. She'd walk the kids down the hall complaining, yell at the kids for being near her, just terrible. One morning, I was covering the desk so my coworker could get breakfast, and Nanny comes down asking about a swimsuit that may have been left at the pool. I told her that no one had turned it into the front desk, but I'd check with housekeeping. And if I found it, I'd get it to her. She walked off mumbling just as Sarah came back from breakfast and told me this lady is rude and complains daily over nothing. I head over to housekeeping and start checking on the housekeepers, since I was working as a supervisor for them that day. I get near Nanny's room and hear her yelling at the housekeeper. The kind of yelling that happens when someone is trying to make someone who doesn't know English magically learn English. I step in, solve Nanny problem, she leaves bitching. Housekeeper makes an inappropriate joke at the most perfect time and goes to clean the Nanny room. I go in to help with the stay over because I wanted the housekeeper done and out before the Nanny got back. When I went to replace the towels in the bathroom, I saw the missing swimsuit hanging to dry by the tub, so that mystery was solved, and I didn't have to talk to Nanny again. Towards the end of my shift, the assistant manager asks if I had helped the front desk during the check-in and dinner rush. I tell her yes, and then let her know Nanny is annoying and maybe a problem. I can't remember all the details, but everyone complained about the Nanny, even the people who didn't care about anyone or anything. The hotel's problem was she hadn't crossed the line to be spoken to or warned. On paper, she was just a pain in the ass. The final straw for me was when she came to the desk to tell me the morning girl admitted to stealing one of the children's swimsuits, and that we had to pay her cash to replace it and find a new one. Now this woman had seen me multiple times that day, but everyone who worked the front desk looked similar enough that we would constantly get mistaken for each other, and would use this to our advantage. Like when this woman told me that I stole a swimsuit, when in fact, I said I would help find it and saw it in her room. I was irritated, to say the least. I told her I would discuss it with the manager, and then she asked me for a shuttle to the downtown restaurant, for her and the kids. Now, I am admittedly that annoying co-worker who struggles to bend the rules for anyone or anything. I also like knowing things and had been around the second longest at that point. At least for the front desk staff. And a few months back, one of the shuttle drivers wondered out loud to herself why it was okay for small children to be in the shuttle without a car seat. I emailed my immediate supervisor and got sent a forwarded email chain that had gone up to regional and basically, it isn't okay. Since I had been in other departments and the rule was if the kid looks young enough to need a car seat, we mention it but don't verify age and leave it to the parent and shuttle driver to make the final decision. No one had made this woman put the kids into a car seat. Well, I informed this lady that I'd be happy to call for a shuttle as soon as she had the car seats in the lobby. No one has made me do it before. They let me on the shuttle without them all the time. The call of the I'm getting my way, people. I responded with, I'm so sorry, I wasn't aware. When I talk to my manager about the swimsuit, I'll ask if the car seats are mandatory. She let huff, and I called the shuttle driver who I told the situation to. I then got a call from Dr. Dad confirming. What I told the nanny was accurate, and he understood it was for the children's safety. Nanny came down and asked the shuttle driver if I was serious, and then she left. I made sure everyone knew these kids had to have their car seats, and the nanny was so frustrated and bitched to my boss, who completely had my back. 
I don't know if Nanny actually cooled it a bit, or if I find so much joy from watching her drag the car seats to and from the shuttle that I didn't notice her bitching as much. Either way, I felt better for the rest of her stay. 2. My story begins about six years ago. I was a frequent and dedicated customer of a locally owned smoke and vape shop in my hometown. The owner heard me say I was looking and offered me a job. It will have to be under the table, and I can't pay more than $10 an hour. I was just happy to be out of the house and seeing someone other than the kids and family. So the owner spent a day training me, gave me her cell number and door keys, then told me to call if I had any questions. That was it. No other info besides, call me if you need pricing. It was kind of a sink or swim thing. They then started another business in another state. My shop was in California. And they opened another biz on the other side of the country. I went from Friday and Saturday to full time. I went two months without being paid because they just never came home. I finally told them, look, I'm basically running the place alone. I can do all the ordering and whatnot, send you it for approval, and then you can just stay there and pay me via Zelle. They said yes to all of it, except for the pay part. Instead, they would have their family friend, T, check the books and receipts, then check my hours, then pay me up to that date every two weeks. T got paid quite handsomely, but also took whatever she pleased from the shop too. I took note of everything she took, how long she was there, and sent it all over to the owner, Lisa. T did not like that, because it was all taken out of her pay, so she started getting busy and not showing up to pay me when she was supposed to. Instead of every two weeks, it was every month or every five or six weeks, and I had to text my boss to beg for an advance of pay to get gas. So from two days a week to seven days a week with ten hour days, Lisa and her hub refused to pay for expensive software, so I did all the supply lists, ordering, and tax stuff on my Google Drive, and sent the info they wanted by email. Eventually, I began to get calls that I had the wrong music playing on the stereo. I played reggae, and she wanted core rap. That she wanted that or this customer out now, which I generally ignored because they were paying customers after all, or things like that. I began updating and improving the shop at their request, all in my own dime that they swore to reimburse, which brought in a bunch of customers and new stock. Our CBD selection and customer base bloomed. Our vape selection went from two shelves to an entire wall, and people from other cities came to our shop because I could repair almost anything that was broken. Our water tobacco pipes area became huge with hand-blown glass pieces from famous and very well-known artists for sale. From my connections, they got them hella cheap and boosted that price 400% to sell them. Basically, I took a small town rinky-dink vape and smoke shop and make it hugely successful, very profitable, and well-known across the state. All this time, I was told I would be getting a percentage of the profits and that I was family, and they always treat family well, with profit sharing being done at Christmas. Christmas comes, and I am told, Our other biz is doing bad. Can we pay you the percentage in six months? I agreed. More the idiot I. COVID happened, but we kept our heads above water, becoming listed as a necessary business. I pointed out their business license still listed them as selling food and snacks, even though they didn't. So we stayed open. All the other shops cut their hours and closed, but we were pulling in cash like never before. T was still coming sporadically, and I was working my ass off, but since I loved the shop and my customers, I tolerated it. But as I was massively overworked, I eventually paid for it. I was admitted into the hospital for two weeks for exhaustion and a heart condition that the exhaustion made worse. The whole time I was in there, my boss kept calling and making me prove I was in the hospital. I had calls constantly from T, who filled in, and just in general, Lisa was pissy as hell I was in the hospital and not her shop. I get out and back in the shop, 
and she asked me to work on a huge project for her. Scan five years' worth of register receipts, enter the daily totals for all five years into a spreadsheet, separated by year, cash, credit, CBD cash, CBD credit, credit report, total bank deposit, hours worked, discounts given, etc. Took me three weeks to do it all. Saved my Google Drive, then email to Lisa. Never thought about it again. Then she calls me frantic because the accountant said it looked like we made way too much during COVID. I told Lisa that we had been the only shop open. That was the difference. She demanded I resend the spreadsheets, but only the part for that year, 2020. I do. Then, out of nowhere, she fires me. Sends in tea with T's daughter, my replacement, and tells me to pack up and leave. No final pay, no reimbursement for the profit sharing, nothing. I call Lisa and she tells me something that pisses me off to this day. You're bringing in the wrong kind of people. I didn't work that hard to update and open that place for you to fill it with LGBTQ and <clears throat> people of color. She may have phrased it very, very differently. That's it. And that she would settle up my pay later. She didn't. I was pissed. I left. I am a lesbian. She knew that. When our store was at its worst during COVID, the LGBTQ community came together and supported the shop because I was there, and we all helped one another. Our biggest and best paying customers were LGBTQ. So, I let all of them know what was said. I also told a few well-placed people about what Lisa had said during our phone call. I also had numerous texts where she had screen-capped the security feed and pointed out people to run off, who strangely had all been people of color. Hmm. I also told the leader of the local LGBTQ association and the Chamber of Commerce leaders what had been said and showed my proof. As they were former customers of mine, they were appalled and spread it far and wide, utterly destroying their customer base. A month after firing me, she called, apologizing for firing me and making up excuses for not paying me, then asking where I had saved that spreadsheet. I told her that it was all in my Google Drive. She said if I sent it to the accountant again, she would settle up. Just on Center 2020, she already has that one. After making my life miserable for years, putting me in the hospital, and then firing me just to pay T's daughter $5 an hour more, yeah, I'm taking my revenge. She gave me the number of her accountant so that I could make sure the info got to her. I called Mrs. Accountant and asked her, Can you send me what you do have? I don't want you to have to go through duplicate documents if you don't have to. See, I knew that Lisa had been tweaking numbers and figures so that her other biz, medical marijuana, could funnel through the store and be seen as legit. See, if you sell medical marijuana, you couldn't really put it into a normal bank because if the feds wanted to, they could seize it because it is still federally illegal. And banks are under federal rules. You had to prove that the money didn't come from selling Med MJ to get it back, which could take years. There are banks that deal solely with people in the marijuana business, but even the cheapest account and the cheapest institution had a $1,000 a month flat fee. This was back in 2020, though. Maybe it's different now. My boss was not one to pay money like that just for a bank account, so she was laundering it through the store. Her accountant thought the numbers were suspicious, but had no proof. Until now, I was sent all the spreadsheets that Lisa had sent her, and wow, was she in trouble! She was claiming that our little store was making over $10,000 a day more than we really were. And it all started happening in, you guessed it, 2020. So I, accidentally, sent her the real spreadsheets for 2020 with all the scanned receipts and the credit report scans and the bank deposit scans. All the info needed to really blast Lisa into the stratosphere. The accountant called and asked me, Are these all real? Are you sure these are the right figures? I said, yep, 
All she needed to do was click on the day, and it hyperlinked you to all that day's info. Register receipt for the day, the square breakdown for the CBD sold that day, and the bank deposit and credit report receipts. I told her that these were the fully updated and accurate info for that year. I remember the accountant signed it stunned. She disliked my boss as much as I did for her lies, late payments, and utter contempt she treated her with. I emailed Lisa and told her all the info was sent, and that I was waiting for the payment as promised. Surprise, surprise! She blocked me and no payment went through. As I was paid under the table, it was a she said, and she and her husband and best friend and her new workers said. So it was the least I could do to take her and her lying ass down. I also looked up the IRS tips email and sent them copies of the real and altered files along with a copy of their business licenses. They would ask me to text them copies of them and their tobacco license. And then also called code enforcement and let them know that their fire alarm system didn't work. That they had no emergency exit and their extinguisher hadn't been serviced in four years. They just sent a friend to fake it. I turned them into the FDA website for selling underage customers. The new cashier was selling to underage all the time. And then sent in an anon tip. They were selling carts and wax. They had made it their new business on the East Coast and were selling out of the shop. The fallout was glorious. They were shut down by code enforcement and the fire department for having black mold on the walls due to leaks they refused to fix, exposed wiring, no up-to-date servicing of the fire alarm system, and the fire extinguisher was inoperable. They were shopped by the FDA and had to pay some pricey fines for three different underage sales and their tobacco license pooled. Right now, the IRS is doing a complete audit of the last 10 years of the store's taxes, and they shut the store's doors for good about two months ago. The bad part, I never got to hear about what happened to their East Coast medical marijuana business. Huh. Oh well. Them's the breaks, I guess. Now you might be about to comment that I am a doormat, or I should sue for wages and turn them into the labor board. As to the doormat, yeah. When I started there, I was in a mentally and verbally abusive relationship. I kicked them out the last year there, and also discovered my backbone. That is when I started asking questions about my pay and such. As to the labor board and suing, I was receiving food stamps, but reporting all my income as self-employed income. I was told that it was illegal to do that. I'm thinking about talking to a lawyer about it all, as I have all the texts with my hours and pay from my former boss saved in my old phone. <laughs> 3. I work for a large global IT company. In the team, we were part of a larger extended team, and an even larger still divisional team. The manager of this division is called Raj. He's based in the States, and is what many would call the poster boy definition of a corporate suck-up. According to him, he is in constant video chats with the CEO, and has lots of face-to-face -face interaction with him. He also appears on much of our division's promotional emails and photographic material, so he's a company-wide recognized person. As for me, I am a trench-working techie from Scotland. My direct manager is always happy with my performance, and I am somewhat known in our extended team, but not so much in the divisional team. Until this event, which was a while before the COVID outbreak, although I was aware of Raj and his reputation, I had never worked with him directly. I got invited to a company-wide collaboration event in America, which we usually use for technical training and innovation discussion. We got there, and there were some initial social events and meet and greets. Raj was amongst the group, and his general demeanor seemed appropriate for the reputation which followed him. We went into the first day bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. I was assigned to a group of ten people to work on a problem with some coding. All was going well until we came to some group presentations. For our group, a young woman named Natalie was speaking for our results. It all seemed to go okay, but after the session was over, Raj asked to see Natalie out in the hall. From inside the room, we could hear Raj literally screaming at her. Many, many offensive slurs were used, and we could hear banging on the wall as well. 
Natalie returned to the room a sobbing mess, much to the shock of everyone. Raj returned as if nothing had happened. This pattern continued over the course of the week. Raj would single out people for these one-on-one -on -one performance critiques. He would go into detail about how work was substandard and how they needed to improve. All while taking group photos for corporate comms for the higher-ups, orchestrating shots to make us all look like one big happy family. I spoke to some of my own team back home about this in my downtime. And it does turn out that this has always been rumored behavior for him. Just no one ever saw someone who had experienced this before. I don't know what the job culture is like for this role in a place like America. But here we have dignity at work regulations. Performance criticism is fine. But not when you're engaging in ritualistic humiliation of your employees. I knew exactly what I was going to do. For the next few days... I made sure that I was delivering more presentations than anyone else, and really making an effort to attract attention. As hoped, he asked me for a chat, and pulled me into the hall. He didn't wait for the door to close before starting his rant. Experiencing it firsthand was... interesting. He claimed I had no idea what I was talking about, even though it had likely been about 20 years since he did any technical work himself. He was vile, shouting and spitting in my face. I also learned what the banging noises were. He would punch doors and slam his hands on the wall near me, as if to try to intimidate me. I was prepared mentally, though, and just smiled and nodded during the entire rant. He looked angry that I was reacting this way, and by the end of it, I thought he was legitimately going to burst a blood vessel. When he was finished, I asked him if he was done. He told me to get out of his sight. And that's when I did it. I gave him a Glazga kiss. For those unfamiliar, it is a headbutt. And it is not the first headbutt I've delivered in my life, having been brought up near Glasgow. He collapsed to the floor in shock, holding his nose, which didn't bleed, unfortunately. Looking up at me, I leaned down, and in my most Glaswegian accent I whispered to him, If you ever disrespect me or my colleagues again, I'll kick the utter fuck out of you next time, yep. <clears throat> well, I used the delightful words that many Americans are appalled by. I went back in the room. Well, he did not. Inevitably, I got the HR call. Raj was in the room as well. And I could see that he had two black eyes as a result of the headbutt. I was asked to explain myself, and I told the truth. Mostly. I explained about his abusive behavior but focused specifically on the hand slamming, and how it had been intimidating me. It hadn't really, but I had massively played up in this aspect of the encounter. I described the headbutt as a reaction when he slammed the wall right next to my head with his hands. I wasn't sure what story he had told them, but I was sent away after this. I ultimately ended up with a disciplinary on my record, but no further consequences. Other team members were interviewed over the next few days, and once the pattern of abuse was established, Raj was terminated from the company. The most satisfying part of this was the day after, when everyone on the course went out for dinner. Natalie insisted that he stand next to her for the division group photograph, black eyes and all. I have to think that photograph contributed to his downfall in some way. 4. This happened back in 2010. When I lived in Winter Garden, Florida with my husband and his dying uncle. Background. My husband and I moved in with his sick uncle after losing so much during the 2008 housing market crash in the US. Like many of my husband's lawn maintenance customers. We also moved in with his uncle into a condo because his uncle had stage 4 cirrhosis of the liver. And his self-entitled sister and her family refused to help take care of him. My husband, a retired Seminole County Sheriff's Officer, and I got ourselves set up in the condo's two bedrooms, as his uncle had himself set up in the living room, including his bed. On the first day, we found dangerous black mold caused by a leaky dishwasher. On the second day, we found the master shower had loose tiles and a leaky shower head. On the third day, we found a nest of brown recluse spiders in the living room. We talked with his uncle about these problems, and found out that the slumlord, friends with his self-entitled sister, aunt, and her family, 
was refusing to take care of the issues as required by law. We wanted to start legal actions then, but my husband's uncle talked us out of it several times. The slumlord was nice to us, so long as my husband's sick uncle was alive. The very next day after my husband's uncle died was a completely different story. Slumlord had turned nasty, aggressive, and began to try strong-arm evictas, like we were nothing more than drug addict squatters. Slumlord even bowed up and aggressively tried to fight my husband when we dropped off our next rent check. He kept telling us that we had to move or else but yet refused to follow actual Florida laws to evict us. Slumlord and his corrupt Winter Garden PD code enforcement officer wife even recruited my husband's self-entitled aunt and uncle to start harassing us about just moving, even if we had to live in a tent. The aunt said, Why don't you and my RSO nephew just move so they can rent the condo to another senior? My husband told her we don't have anywhere else to go yet, and he must go through eviction laws or get into very serious trouble. You're nothing but trouble, retired SCSD officer nephew. You've been problems since the day you were born. Get out of their condo and stop being a problem for everyone. Who cares if you live in a tent? All of this made my retired SCD officer husband, who specialized in uncovering corrupted law enforcement, very suspicious. We talked and began investigating Slumlord and corrupt code enforcement wife. My first order was to place all rent into escrow with evidence of repairs that have been neglected. Second, I sent a notification of cease and desist of harassment to the Slumlord and the aunt. Next, I researched public property tax records. Woohoo! Pay dirt there! Slumlord's condo wasn't registered as a rental property with the state of Florida and was paying far less in property taxes than Slumlord should have been paying. Property tax records also showed that he did not own the condo. It was still deeded to his mother, who I found out had been living in a retirement home for five years before my husband's uncle moved in. My, my husband found out that the wife had been inspecting and signing off on hers and Slumlord's properties, including the condo, which is against Florida code enforcement conduct laws. I found out from neighbors in the condo that some lord had only been renting to seniors with severe health issues. My best discovery though, next to tax evasion, was finding out that the condo owners association had a very strict no renting and leasing policy, meaning you or your family had to live in the condo and couldn't be rented. The Revenge Now that we had all of our evidence, my husband and I began to knock down all of the sun lord's dominoes. My husband went and filed a complaint with the Winter Garden Police Department about corrupt code enforcement wife and her perjuring inspections on her family properties. My husband has a glowing record in Seminole County and with the FDLE for having over 200 clean arrests and taking down nearly 60 corrupt public officials, including Child Protective Services in the early 2000s. This background helped push WGPD to open an investigation into corrupt code enforcement wife. They discovered that not only had she perjured inspections on her family's properties, but also on my husband's self-entitled aunt and uncle's property as well. This got her fired, stripped of her state enforcement officer's license, and convicted of multiple crimes. I sent all property tax fraud evidence to Florida's property tax division. That got the state to investigate some lord. The state found that not only did he commit property tax fraud on the condo, but also on property that he was renting to his son and self-entitled aunt's son, along with business tax fraud and income tax fraud. Both Slumlord's son and self-entitled aunt's son were also busted for possession of illegal narcotics, with intent to sell when investigators came to the rental house they lived. I never expected that much fraud to be found from all of this, but I'm glad it happened. The business tax fraud of Sunlord affected self-entitled aunt and self-entitled uncle as well, since they were his business partners. The uncle then came under investigation by the USPS board, as he was the postmaster of Winter Garden. Self-entitled uncle lost his comfy job and pension after it was discovered how he was assisting Sunlord in the tax fraud scam 
and for stealing money orders. All four were convicted of multiple white-collar crimes, had to sell their properties and most of their stuff, serve some form of time, and pay huge amounts of fines and restitution. Slumlord's wife, Hubby's self-entitled aunt, and Hubby's self-entitled uncle, along with their sons, all went down for multiple crimes, both felonies and misdemeanors, all because they thought they could strong-arm evictors. Just proves how smart we tenants can really be when pushed. Also proves why everyone should know all rental laws and how to research public records, because it can save you in the end. 5. I worked for two years at a tile store. I handled customers as well as worked in the warehouse. Not to brag, but those two years I worked the earliest shift that no one wanted, because you had to receive the daily truck and put the tile orders away by hand at 6 in the morning. But I also said I would work every Saturday as well. Now, I didn't do this because I hated myself and wanted to suffer. It was because I wanted the outside sales job. The outside salesman that got the job entered right after I started, and we hit it off quickly. Joe. Joe confided in me that he had no plans to continue this job after about a year or so. So from the get-go, I said I wanted that job and worked my butt off to get it. Pulling shifts no one wanted, doing jobs no one wanted to do, and doing things that were definitely not part of my job description. This included doing a lot of outside sales jobs. I would take over when Joe would call out or just needed help. He came to rely on me and gave me part of his job. I saw this as a type of internship and thought it would pay off. Fast forward two years, Joe tells me that he is about to put in his two weeks and to get my resume together. He puts in his two weeks notice. I immediately put my application in. I got the backing from both Joe and the branch manager to get the job and did a pretty good job in the interview. I knew that I was pretty much a shoo-in for the job. I had seniority and had never caused a problem in my time there. I had a very good relationship with the contractors I sold to and knew all of them by name. The main part of the outside sales job was working with the contractors, so I felt confident, to say the least, that I had what the company was looking for. Two other employees applied as well, an ex-convict who had anger problems Bob, and a recently hired woman who had no experience in tile, Anne. The only other job she had ever done was a secretary, and she was currently just helping customers with selections. Both of them were older than me. I was in my early 20s, and both of them in the 30s. A couple of days after that, I got a call from HR, telling me I didn't get the job. Instead, they wanted to give it to Annie. I won't lie, I thought I misheard, or it was a prank at first. The only reason HR would give me to why they passed me up for the position was, You're just too good of a worker and valuable at your position for us to lose you. You do such a good job and are so responsible, we would hate to lose that. So, because I'm good at my job, you won't hire me for another one with more responsibilities. Yep, but to show you how much we appreciate you, we're giving you a $1 raise. Do I still get my yearly $1 raise on top of this in a couple of months? No, think of this as we're giving you it two months early. I was fuming for a couple of days. Their excuse didn't make sense, and I had the feeling that I was being discriminated against due to my age. However, I was set upon making a point that they chose the wrong person and come up with a plan. Because I was so good at my job, I didn't get the outside sales job. So if I was bad at my job, maybe they would promote me then. Let me rephrase. I wasn't bad at my job, but I told my shift manager that I would no longer work the morning shift, would no longer be there on Saturdays, would no longer do the worst jobs, and would no longer be doing any jobs that fell outside my description, including the outside sales job I had been helping with. And goes out for a couple of weeks of training and personal time, during which things are already starting to fall apart. My manager asks me to fill in for Anne while she's still away. He understands why I'm doing what I am, but asks as a personal favor. 
I agree, and things begin to get back to where they were before. Anne comes back, and I resume my firm stand. Anytime something was supposed to be done by the outside sales position, that I normally did, I would send it her way. Customers, problems, heavy to lift things, and other favors I used to do for Joe, I refused to do for her. It gave me a little relief to see her running everywhere, trying to get everything done. She only asked me once to help her, to which I just told her that it wasn't my job. The first couple of weeks, things were a little rough, as most of the jobs were left over from when Joe and I were running things. So most of the problems came from the daily grind. But the weeks that followed were chaotic, to say the least. Items came in late, jobs were missing and unordered, contractors didn't understand where the materials were. Mind you, these guys get paid per job. So every day their material isn't there is another day they don't work or get paid. So when their materials didn't come in, their workers who were paid hourly are getting paid for no reason at all. My favorite one is when she accidentally sent an order across the country, costing the company thousands as we lost money in that job. As things were starting to turn into the dumpster fire, I knew it would, HR called me to talk about my attitude. We've heard your attitude as of late. It doesn't sound like you're being a team player. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Have I said something hurtful to someone? No. Did I hurt someone's feelings unintentionally? No. I don't understand what attitude you're talking about, then. We've received word that you aren't being as helpful as you were to Joe as you are now to Annie. Well, you see, I'm far too valuable at my current job. I can't possibly detract away from that. They immediately saw that they made a mistake in giving me that reason as to why they didn't hire me. They then told me that I needed to be more of a team player, and would pay me an additional one dollar an hour when the yearly raise came around in two months. I told them that it wasn't my job to do what they were asking, and if they wanted me to do that, they would have to negotiate my contract. They told me they would need to discuss it and to reconsider being a team player. I didn't relent, and they weren't interested in renegotiating my contract. Well, two months after Annie got the job and things went to hell, she stepped down. Again, I put in my resume, as did Bob. Now, remember how I said he had a slight anger issue? Well, that came to a head just before Anne put her two weeks' notice in. Bob threatened a contractor. The contractor was a real piece of work, but that doesn't excuse the fact that Bob threatened the guy. Regardless with this now happening and Anne putting in her two weeks, I couldn't see how they couldn't hire me. It was me or someone who threatened customers. I once again go through the process. But this time I play my cards close to my chest. They didn't know that after Annie was chosen over me, I started to look for a new job. Just as this interview process was going on, a company called me back and offered me an outside sales job at their company. It was lower pay than the current companies, but they didn't need to know that. They also did not know that I accepted the position and told them I needed to finish my two weeks. I wasn't going to give them my two weeks, though. I was going to make it look like it was a competition and try to string it for those two weeks. The company offered me the outside sales job and nearly begged me to take it. They apologized for making the bad decision of picking Anne over me and told me that they would love to have me in the position. Now let the fun begin. I promptly told them that I would need to think about it as their competitor had also just offered me the same job for a higher pay. The look on their faces was to die for. I pretended that it was a back and forth for two weeks, which conveniently went over Annie's quitting date and my new job's starting date. They got anxious because they now didn't have anyone for the job and finally gave me a final offer. I promptly shot them down and told them I didn't want to work for a company that treats their hard-working employees like shit. They can sleep in the bed they made. Then I told them I was starting the next day at the other company. I have never been so happy. Hey everybody, Halfraiser here, and thank you very much for listening to Revenge is Ice Cream, episode 139. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. I'd appreciate it if you shared the video around with all your friends and family. I'd also like to give a weekly shout out to all those good folks who have been using the little tip jar button in the description. That's a little heart with a dollar sign. Uh, it 
took me embarrassingly longer than I care to admit to realise tip jar was the actual term for it. I spent quite a while last week trying to explain what it was. It's a tip jar. There we go. Okay, today is a Sunday. Ooh, my voice is a little rough right now, isn't it? Uh, I will rest before I record again. And let's see, are there any birthday shoutouts today? I don't think there are, no. Um, I think the next one's the 18th. And so that brings us right to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today it is, which fictional character, just one, do you wish was a real person in the world today? I'm going to choose Lilith from True Blood. Now, I can't remember if she was just in the TV show or if she was in the original books as well, but she was the first vampire, and that would mean vampires would be real, which would be scary, but also kind of neat. Okay, leave your answers in a comment below. Or up, if you're watching the video upside down. I don't judge. Okay, and with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourself.